Thanks for being with us here today. I want to go ahead and invite you to find in your Bible Psalm 78. Psalm 78 in the Word of God today. We are in a message series, a teaching series, if you will, on the subject next, what it looks like for us to be able to take next steps with intentionality in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always good to come together on special occasions like this as well to be able to honor mothers. We're so grateful to be able to do that. I was reminded of a little boy who was in Sunday school class and uh, the Sunday school teacher, she said, hey, little Billy, she says, "Uh, do you pray before dinner? He says, I don't need to. My mama's a good cook. (laughs) And uh, well, I'm not sure those are two mutually exclusive things, but uh, we are grateful for every single thing that you moms bring into our lives. And many times uh, you think they go unnoticed, but we are certainly, certainly grateful for that. And uh, so we honor you today. We're going to be giving our attention in this teaching series next about strong homes. And last week we talked about what it looks like to have discipleship in those primary relationships in our life. And many times when we think about homes or family, we think in terms of a a husband to a wife or a, a father and mother to a child. And last week we focused on uh, the opportunity to invest in brothers and sisters in Christ, our second family, what God has blessed us with and the importance of doing so. And I know that you were blessed. Many of you all told us last week when we had our panel and we talked about what it looks like for us to invest in future generations. Well, today we're going to give our attention into the home and we're going to talk about that parenting relationship with children. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture in Psalm 78. And we're going to look at the first eight verses of that this morning. But before we do, let's simply just remind ourselves of the Olympics. And many of you all enjoy the Winter Olympics or the Summer Olympics. How many of you all are big fans of the Winter Olympics? Raise your hand. You like the Winter Olympics more than the Summer Olympics? Okay, put your hands down. How many of you all like the Summer Olympics better? Okay, how many of you all know what the Olympics are? (laughs) All right. Well, one of the things that I like about the Summer Olympics specifically is is when you get to the track and field, and there's such a variety when it comes to the track and field, and one of those uh, races that I actually enjoy watching are the relay races, and those relay races are typically like a four by 100, and uh, individuals are able to run um, uh, together as a team, and one of the things about the four by 400 that's really remarkable is, is that When it comes to this particular race, it's not an individual sport. It's not an individual sport. It's not an individual accomplishment. And what it requires is is for an individual working together with other individuals, but that individual gives it their all, gives it everything they have, even though they know what they contribute isn't the entire race. They know that they only have a portion of that race to run, but they give it everything that they have, knowing that there is more race beyond what they're able to contribute, but yet they give everything they have for what they are responsible for. And they also know that what makes that race successful is the handoff. Being able to take that baton and bring it from one runner to the next, and as they process that race and as they're moving and navigating around the field they enter into what is called the exchange zone the exchange zone is that is that limited period of space where they are able for one runner to be able to hand off that baton successfully to the next and if they are not able to do so there's disqualification well that's the same in life for so many of us is we have this opportunity to recognize that the race is much bigger than us isn't it The race is significantly bigger than us, but each of us are required to be able to run the portion that the Lord has set before us. And the portion that the Lord has set before us, we are called to give it everything we have. And then we need to make sure that we give the handoff. But understanding just as in a relay race, as well as in life itself, When it comes from the relay of passing on spiritual formation, passing on the faith, passing on the truths of God and his word, being able to pass that on, do you know what? We also have an exchange zone. There is a limited window of opportunity for us to be able to do that successfully. 
And when we miss that window, it has dire consequences. And so today we're going to look at Psalm 78. And these are the words that have been written by the psalmist. And it's instructing us to be able to instruct others. Instructing us so that we may be able to instruct others. Let's begin here in verse 1 of Psalm 78. And he says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation. The glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. For he has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The words that he writes and he begins is is simply a a call here in verse 1 to pay attention. For the hearer, for the reader, to pay attention to the things that are about to be spoken. He, he says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. How many times have we as fathers and mothers, have we tried to uh, speak into the life of, of our children and, and we have to be like, pay attention. What I'm about to say is important. Give attention, give focus to the things that are to be said. And he's calling on them to to pay attention. Why are we called to pay attention? Because he says here in verse 2, he says, I will open my mouth in a parable and I will utter dark sayings from of old. Now that sounds like just kind of crazy talk, doesn't it? I'm going to utter dark sayings of old. That sounds like a science fiction kind of a thing or a thriller. But here's what he's saying. And you'll see a similar type of a phrase in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 6. He's saying, what I'm about to tell you is is profound. What I'm about to tell you is is the mysteries of God. What I'm about to tell you are the things of God that that are, are so mysterious and profound. I want you to pay attention. The things that I'm about to tell you, they are of old. Here's what he's saying. I want you to pay attention to these timeless truths of the mysteries of God. What God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, was willing to do on our behalf to be our God and we to be his people. He says, I want you to pay attention. There is a timeless truth that needs to be told. It is not to be concealed. He says, we will not hide it from our children or from children's children, even yet the unborn, so that they can tell their children. He wants to make sure that they understand the things of God. He says in verse 8, and he shows us in verse 8 what it's like when we are a stubborn generation. A stubborn generation can have impact for generations to come. And he calls us not to be a stubborn generation, but a steadfast generation. To be able to give it all you have for your lap of the race. Being able to, in the relay of the next generation... To take the things that you have, run with all you have, and then when you get in that exchange zone that you hand that off well. He's saying you only have a limited window of opportunity. How many of you parents who are empty nesters now, you look back and say, man, it flew by so quickly. It seemed like just the other day they were Uh, making all the noise and chaos was everywhere and now chaos has been replaced by quiet and you've walked through that season and you know that there's only a season of time where you're able to give that investment in such a way where it pays significant dividends 
And you want to take advantage of your lap. You want to take advantage of the exchange zone. You want to be able to pass that relay of God's truth to the next generation. Well, for all of us here, God has a word today. And whether you're a parent uh, or whether you're not a parent, all of us have something from God's word here today. But what I would tell you is in the midst of the relay from one generation to another, the relay of God's truth from one generation to another, God, in his wisdom and in his design, he, he, he strategically uses two groups of person in the faith formation of the next generation. He strategically uses two groups of people, two types of people, in that faith formation of the next generation. The first one is this, number one, that God calls moms and dads to the responsibility of faithful parenting. God calls mom and dads to the responsibility of faithful parenting. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, God speaks into the lives of the parents. He says, bring them up, bring the children up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. To bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Those two phrases are used often together to talk about a complete understanding of who God is and, and God's design and how God has called us to live. And he says, parents, we ought to bring up, bring up our children, raise them up with the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. The book of Proverbs connects these two often in the wisdom that God gives in that Old Testament book on how to live. And so we have this call to be able to bring them up. And so what the Bible actually teaches us is that parents are the, the primary influencers in the lives of their children. And sometimes parents mistakenly think, well, isn't that the job of the pastor? Or isn't that the job of the Sunday school teacher? Isn't that the job of a small group leader or a children's ministry leader? Isn't that their responsibility? Isn't there the responsibility of the church to be the primary influencer of children. But just think about the number of hours in a week. And the number of hours in a week, you are spending significantly more time with your children than anyone else. Significantly more time than they're involved with other faith leaders in the church, with their pastor and teachers and other faith leaders. And so just as a reminder, parents, you are the primary influencer in the life of your children. And so in the relay of life in the next generation, God calls us as parents to be faithful in our parenting. Now, by observation, I, I simply want to say as, as a parent myself, I experience this and then I observe it on steroids. Here's what I wanted you to see. Many parents are actively involved in their children's life and in their children's welfare. They have their children in mind. We, we all, as parents, we want our children to have full and meaningful lives. Wouldn't you agree? We all want our children to have full and meaningful lives. There's, there's not a parent that just says, well, I hope that my children only experience a half-life or an empty life, a, a meaningless life. Nobody says that. No parent says that. We all want our children to have a full and meaningful life. And so what happens is, is you start watching all of these parents. And so they jump in, they invest in their kids and they serve as scout leaders. They serve as band boosters. They serve as ball coaches. They serve as lunchroom monitors. They serve as team volunteers. Parents are willing to jump in anywhere and everywhere to make sure that their kids are having full and meaningful lives. They pour so much time so much energy and so many resources in making sure our kids are well-rounded. But I wonder, are we as parents giving the same effort that we give in seeing that our kids are well-rounded? Do we give that same effort to make sure that our kids are well-grounded? Are we willing to do that? Why is it that we will jump in and do everything else? Scout leader, band booster, ball coach, lunchroom monitor, team volunteer. Why are we willing to jump in so many places to make sure our kids are well-rounded when we don't jump in to make sure that they're well-grounded? 
And this isn't an indictment to say that we parents shouldn't care about the activities or experiences of our kids. Our children should have rich, be rich in the activities and experiences of life. But many of our kids are rich in the experiences of life, but they're poor in their experience with Christ. And so there is this call here for parents. And it's not a call to say that your children shouldn't be well-rounded, but Jesus cautions us not to miss the main thing. And the main thing, he says in Mark chapter 8 and verse 36, he says, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Another way to say that is, what does it benefit your child to experience everything that this world has to offer and never experience Christ? We as parents, we are called to be that primary influencer in the relay of life to the next generation, that relay of faith formation into the next generation, passing on God's truths from one generation to another And so, moms and dads, let me just simply challenge you from the word of God and the relay of life. Be faithful in your parenting as a primary discipler, a primary influencer in the life of your kids. But in addition to that, number two, God calls the church family to the responsibility of faithful partnering. God calls the moms and dads to the responsibility of faithful parenting God calls the church family to the responsibility of faithful partnering. And that's good to know. And and many times as a parent, it's good to know that we are not alone. It's good to know that with such a, a, a significant responsibility that we are not alone. And it's by God's wisdom and God's design that he brings us into a family of faith. We talked about that last week, being able to, we're not related by blood, but we're united by his blood. All of us here, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we have an investment in this relay of the next generation. And God calls the church family to this responsibility of faithful partnering. And so the church isn't to be a replacement for the parent, but we ought to be a reinforcement for the parent. We ought to be able to encourage them in faith formation. We ought to be able to come alongside and and strengthen that parent. And certainly there are occasions where the church becomes, and faith leaders and pastors and Sunday school teachers and others become a primary influencer because of the absence of that in the home. But God's design is not for the church to be the parent, but the church to be the partner and to come alongside and to strengthen the parent's ministry of influence. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. And so we simply understand that there is strength in partnership and the potential for faith development. It strengthens when that partnership between the parents and the church family is strong. And as a church, we we have this responsibility. It's easy sometimes to think that, well, my my children are, are, are grown and out of the house. I don't have any more investment in the next generation. Or maybe you look and say, I don't have any children, so I don't have any skin in the game for the next generation. Well, we all have skin in the game for the next generation because the race is longer than the lap that each of us will run. And so God has called us to do that well. Run well the lap that God's given. Give it everything you got, but make sure that you take advantage of the exchange zone and hand those things off well so that the next generation can proclaim the things of the Lord. Now, we've talked in this series next about strong hearts. We're talking about strong homes, and we'll talk about strong hands coming up. But these are lanes of life where you following after Jesus, where you are walking after him, these are lanes of life that you're going to spend a lot of your time in. Certainly your personal life, that makes sense. But then those primary relationships as identified by strong homes and then being able to 
serve and to make a difference in the world the way that Jesus calls us to. Now listen, I understand even as a parent, sometimes you run up against things and you're trying to think, how do we convey this to our children? How do we pass along the truths of God? How do we make this uh, an opportunity for them to grow towards Jesus? And we have designed here, your, your staff leaders and your ministry leaders here, we have designed a parent pathway that is, is unique to second in many ways, similar to others, but unique to second in many ways. And, and what I want to do just for a few moments is, is to walk you through what our commitments are here as Second Baptists in our philosophy of discipleship. And if you are a parent that still has kids in the home, I, I, I want you to pay attention, but even if your home is empty of children, understand where we are investing and how we're trying to invest in the next generation. And what you can expect if you raise your children here at Second Baptist Church from, from the time that they are born to the time that they graduate and, and, and leave your home, hopefully not to move back in, amen, but graduate and leave home. But here's, here's the thing I want you to see. Don't miss this. We want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we at Second Baptist are invested in the faith formation of your children. It is a high value commitment for us. And we want you to know that we are, we are committed to the next generation in this relay race that God has for us of being able to hand off the faith. And so I want to walk you through some of this this morning. It all begins in what we call the dedication. And the dedication is, is where we partner with parents who are the primary faith trainers in their child's faith development. Many of you all will see this milestone being lived out on the platform when we do the parent-child dedication. But it isn't simply something where you just come and sign up and we want to we bring our baby out here or we want to bring our child out here. What we do at the beginning of that is, is we begin to invest and say, listen, as a parent, here how, here's how God has designed your role. And we want them to understand clearly that they're the primary influencer. We want to begin to start to invest and equip them with opportunities, workshops, seminars, other things that help begin to answer some of those questions early on. And it all begins at the dedication. But it also allows the parent to just say, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping out in faith on a path to be able to strategically lead my kids in the things of the Lord. And so it begins with the dedication. The next step is what we call the foundation. And this is where we partner with parents in teaching the concepts and truth of how to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So it is important for us at an early stage of the life of the child's development to help them to have these concepts. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Why should we follow Jesus? Who is Jesus? And we began to help them to understand who Jesus is as God's only son and the only savior for the world. We began to build these concepts that they can understand and ask their questions so that they can know that God has sent Jesus into this world to save them. And in this process, there are opportunities with uh, teaching opportunities, workshop opportunities, and many times we celebrate this at the end with those new believers and those baptisms. And it's an opportunity for the church to celebrate, but there's much that goes on behind the scenes than just the simple milestone celebration. But it's important, the Word of God says it's important to lay a good foundation. It's important, if you're going to build a life it's important to have a good foundation. If you're going to build a house, you want to have a good foundation. If you want to build a life, you want to have a good foundation. We're committed to that pathway step here. The next step would be what we call the formation. The formation. And this is where we, we come alongside the parents in teaching their children to understand. Now, this is important. To understand their identity in Christ. Well, there's a lot of talk today about identity and how we can just jump in and out of all kinds of different identities. We can be whatever we want to be, identify as what we want to identify as. We want people to understand 
who God has designed you to be. We want them to know their identity and specifically as a Christ follower, their identity in Christ and how they can grow in his likeness. This formation piece is significant. And there's multiple opportunities and multiple ways that we'll invest in this formation stage in the life of your child. And we'll come alongside you parents in those critical years when you were in that exchange zone, when you were trying to hand off those truths of the faith, when you're trying to build them into the life of your child. And as you do, understand that God will be at work in them while you are faithful to them in proclaiming the truths of God. And that formation stage is significantly important. And so there are things that we'll do around that and milestones we'll do to celebrate that. The next area in the child's faith development that we are committed to in our parent pathway is what we're calling conversation. Now, let me ask you this. Parents, did you ever have to have a tough conversation with your kids? Did you ever just set aside the years between roughly 12 and 18 and know that you're going to have a lot of rough conversations? Did you just pencil that into your calendar, block off the next six years? Because you're going to have tough conversations. Your child, as they move into adolescence, are going to be faced with the things of the world, and you, parent, are going to be faced with questions. They'll come and say, Mom, Dad, and you're going to have to have tough conversations. Because the world in its deceitful ways is already actively with a megaphone trying to deceive this next generation. And you have the opportunity to have tough conversations. And so in this stage of the parent pathway, we want to help come alongside you parents and help you with the skills and the knowledge to engage in those tough conversations. To engage in those tough conversations with your children and with your adolescents. Here's why this matters. And here's why the sequence matters. Because as the world continues to try to tear them down and confuse them about their identity, you have already been sowing the seeds as a parent in their formation. So when you have the formation being built in, when it comes time for the tough conversation, you are able to draw them back to those eternal, timeless, biblical truths that God has given If you get to the tough conversations and we've never laid any groundwork, it's a much more difficult time. But those conversations are going to, listen, those conversations are going to come no matter how well you've parented through the years. Tough conversations are going to come. But we're going to have those opportunities to follow up with that. And then we have a a stage that's known as the preparation And preparation is is where we partner to equip parents to lead their teenager through adolescence into adulthood. That's hard to navigate in and of itself. And in those years, it's often difficult to, uh, to walk out your faith and to live out your faith. And you as a parent have that opportunity to help prepare them because pretty soon your adolescent is going to move out into adulthood. And when they move out into adulthood, you want them to be as thoroughly equipped as possible. And so use that preparation time to help them to develop that lasting ownership of beliefs. And finally, the last step or the last stage in the parent pathway here at Second Baptist Church, we're calling preparation. That preparation is where we partner with the parents uh, to equip them to lead their teenager out the door, commissioning them. And, And the way that that looks is simply like this. We want to partner them to launch their young people as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. It's the commission. The commission is simply this. The word commission, it's to send, to send. And we as parents, we want to, we want to send our children out. Some of you want to send them out quicker than others. I understand. But you want to send them out. But every parent wants to send their children adolescent into adult, they're young adult, they want to send that young adult out, they want to send them out well. 
And so we simply wanted to take the time in this series. It's a different series, but it's a time to teach and instruct and educate. We want you to know where our commitments lie here as a Second Baptist philosophy, where our ministers are working together from the preschool department to the children's department, the children's department to the students, students to college, and colleges commissioned out. All of these things working together. Why? And by the way, our staff is learning to relay well in the exchange zones between age-graded ministries. Why? All working together because we believe that God has called all of us. Parents, you're to be a faithful parent, but the church should be faithful partners, and together we can impact the next generation. Why is this so important? Well, the psalmist actually says it very well in verse 7. So that they should set their hope in God. And not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Listen, why do we make this investment? Why do we put our energy into this? Why are we involved in this? Why do we believe that if you as a parent make your commitment and you come and say, we're going to invest in this and whether our child is just being born or wherever we're at on this process. But if you raise your children here, you know that these things are available to you, that we're invested with you in this. Why? So that your children can set their hope on God to set their hope in him, that they may know him and follow him and take their next step. And so that is our commitment, and we pray that you'll journey with us in those opportunities to reach the next generation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity today uh, to give our attention to strong homes and investing in the next generation. And Father, I pray that you help us to do that well. Lord, I just ask that in our our time that we have in partnership with one another through the months and the years that you give us together at Second Baptist, God, may our invested efforts make a difference in the life of the coming generation. But Lord, we cannot do anything in our own power or our own strength. We We need you, precious Holy Spirit. Go before us and work within us and work within the lives of the next generation so that we can have a a significant impact for the truth and for the faith so that others may set their hope in God. Lord, I pray that you help us in our failings, our shortcomings. As parents, we have many shortcomings. As partners, we have many shortcomings. Lord, help us to grow in those areas to help have stronger homes. God, this is my prayer today as I pray it over our people and I pray it in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.